All right, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alona, your host for today. And let me share you some um, introduction. Oh. Okay. So, um, so, welcome to the March Summit. Um, I just want to inform you that this is a collaborative uh, space and that uh, we want everyone to jump in and participate. So we expect everyone to be kind with each other. And so if you have any questions, uh, don't hesitate to ask. Um, also, if you want to become a sponsor, then we have here the gold, the silver, and yeah, the platinum. And so that's it. Over to you, Petra. Hi, everyone. Um, and thank you for joining uh, me and this um, very cool panel I gathered. Um, and we're here to discuss on the topic of cloud security, um, more of um, the cloud security architect role. So basically, I call them in the title, the Knights of the Cloud Kingdom. And why? Well, because they are in a way knights, because they're protecting the cloud uh, premises. So um, I'm going to first let the panelists introduce themselves, and then we're going to ask a couple of questions. Um, and you know, we're gonna get some interesting opinions um, about this cloud architect role. All right, so we're gonna start with Christy. Uh, please introduce yourself. Thanks Petra, it's wonderful. Thank you for having me here. Hello everyone, my name is Kriti Mohan. I uh, am a security engineer, I work for Palo Alto Networks. I've been in the industry for a good 12 years now with a vulnerability management background. Uh, security infrastructure background, and uh, hopefully we'll uh, sort of have a nice conversation discussion around the knights of the cloud. Not that I am exactly what, but I'll pass it on to Frank. Hey everyone, my name is Francesco Cipollone. I am uh, a cloud fight or a cloud knight since long. Um, chair of the Cloud Security Alliance for UK, so we're very keen to talk anything uh, cloud related and also shout out to anyone that want to write about the subject afterwards we are open to uh, blog guest blog and other stuff and also I'm the CEO of AppSec Phoenix where we focus on cloud security application security and vulnerability management overall to make people's life better Manuel on to you Excellent. Hi, nice to meet you. I'm Emmanuel Scalidis. Um, thanks for having me. I'm the Information Security Architect for Virgin Red, and I'm um, doing security, overall security over there for the guys. I come from a network security and cloud security background, so I've been there. I've done some of the things that we're going to discussing, be discussing about, and now in the in the architect role. I've been. I'm really keen to discuss about the challenges that we face um, with finding um, uh, any problems in our architecture. How do we mediate them, and and generally, what do we do to to progress uh, with uh, all the tools that we want to implement and the results we get out of them. And Lee, thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Lee. I've been working in cloud security since about 2009. I've uh, been in Infosec since 1998. Uh, day job is a director at Capgemini, so I'll be answering lots of these questions from that horrible enterprise perspective. And Don't forget CSA. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, I've been a long time involved with the CSA for a long time as well. So I contributed to version two of the CSA's core guidance, and I've been involved in the UK chapter since about 2015. Cool. Excellent. Thank you very much. And I'm just going to shortly introduce myself. Um, my name is Petra Bukmurit, and I'm a senior security engineer in Zava. I used to work in uh, Glasgow as well before as a um, cybersecurity engineer. Um, and I do have quite a big interest in application security and uh, cloud security as well. Okay, so um, we're going to start a little bit um, with a question about the role itself. Um, anyone who wants to uh, add anything, feel, feel free to um, unmute yourself or ask to be muted um, and ask a question or put it in the chat or even uh, raise your hand. Um, so we can start with Francesco. So um, what do you think from your point of view, which port do these knights hold? So do you think um, 
the cloud security architect should sit within the security team? Um, do you think that this role should be within DevOps team? Or do you even think that this should, you know, the cloud security architect should just be part of a squad who makes a specific project? Um, and in addition to answering these three, you know, this, this question, um, if you can just a little bit say, um, generally, how would you, from your point of view, define the role? Um, and yeah, over to you. Thank you, Petra. Great question. So uh, let me start maybe that, let me start being controversial as a new thing that <laughs> I think the architect role would died a little while ago, uh, then was reborn, then died again with the DevSecOps and the DevOps kind of mentality progressing and the new kind of clouds uh, expanding. So traditionally the architect role used to be kind of the gatekeeper of what good looks like and then slowly and, and surely evolved in, in recommending and helping team on building stuff right. But also I always say with the, the role of the architect is making sure that the building doesn't start um, growing horizontally instead of just vertically or organically. And with the cloud advent and security being on the back foot, I think the security architect role was a little bit challenging because the thing underneath what developers and the whole organization was building was going faster than what it could even be predicted. So for a long time, I think the security architect role played catch up. And just now we started to getting ahead with the cloud patents and what good looks like and start getting integrated. And then the whole uh, thing is changing again because a lot of what we build is actually cloud native, is becoming more and more code, is becoming more codified. So the architect role has been dramatically challenged in so many years and actually in so little time and changing kind of hats so many times. And the best answer I can give is like, it doesn't really matter where the architect role sits. Traditionally, the security architect sits underneath uh, security and then depending on how big the organization is and how big the cloud initiative is, I've seen center of excellence, I've seen central cloud security transformation role, uh, and I've seen any nuance and variance. I think the best answer I can give you is, uh, it really depends by the need of the organization. So if an organization is at the beginning of the cloud journey, there is a lot of planning, exercise, architecting and structuring how ongoing the cloud should look like, creating a blueprint for now and a blueprint for later with a number of controls so that you build you build kind of the foundation of the architecture. And you know, with this, with the CSA, we bang on the foundation a lot. We we talked about a lot because building something right from the very beginning assure and ensure you that you know whatever you build inside remain at least with a baseline of security. And then as the organization evolves, then it really depends how fast it evolves from a code perspective or from a traditional architectural perspective. Um, generally speaking, I've seen center of excellence growing after a transformation happened that starts serving a number of projects. And the more mature version of those kind of center of excellence is when patents are being taken from pure architectural perspective, pure from PDF into code, starting codifying fundamentally control, start codifying the baseline control. And that's where fundamentally the security architect or the cloud security architect start engaging and start collaborating very actively with uh, the development team, but it can't be a vacuum. Uh, it's an evolution of the role in organization and traditionally it requires a lot of experience and a lot of oversight. And I think there is a scarcity of that role. So people have done one, two aspect of it, or, or a lot of people try to improvise themselves in, into their role to pivot. Uh, the challenge is with cloud, you need to know a lot more than just infrastructure, a lot more than traditional security. Um, and application security and cloud security are getting more and more blurred. So it's, it's a particularly challenging role, if not the 
most challenging role uh, I've seen. And it really depends how you go. So my suggestion for anybody is really just find an organization that want to start uh, the cloud journey from scratch and going throughout the whole journey. And there are tons of them. Maybe don't choose a, a financial institution that is a bit more complicated, <laughs> like we started. Um, but you know, just something that that build your skills and build your uh, structure, and then pivot fundamentally your strength point from a traditional security architect into a cloud security architect, and start getting engaged on how best to serve. Uh, fundamentally develop a team because those will be your customer, those will be your client, those will be the people that as a cloud security architect you tend to serve and the best way to embed security is making them your friend and is creating artifact that they can use day in and day out. Better if you can codify those things and you can cloud form but you know I can go in a very very long rant about this. But yeah, that's in a nutshell or in a nutshell. <laughs> Are you? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go to that one. I yeah. think Francesco picked on a, an interesting point there around that difference between the foundation and the workload. So I don't think there is a single cloud security architect. There are different flavors of cloud security architect and they'll be doing different things depending upon whether they are maybe in a center of excellence or maybe on a specific project. I think regardless of who and where they sit, I think the key thing for an architect is to be able to answer the why question. So why are we doing this? And that is the key role of the architect is to be able to explain to the business why they're doing this. It's also to be able to explain to their colleagues, whether that's within a COE or within a development squad, well, why are you stopping me from doing this? You've got to be able to answer the why question and that's the role of the architect from my perspective. Yeah, and, uh, and the role of the architect, it has fallen a bit to have them the consultancy role. So from the, the way I've perceived it and I've experienced it is like, we're sitting in between the teams. We've got a lot of people asking us, okay, what do we need to do that? Or do we need to, is that secure? Well, how is this happening? So you need to have a, a broad understanding of how we're doing um, uh, microservices, how we're doing, uh, what are the tools that we're using, etc. So you can go into these meetings and inspire the guys that you know what you're talking about, which is a big, it's a really important aspect. We need to go into those meetings and say, okay, guys, we're going to put this control in, either because we're doing it for a compliance reason, or we need to get out of, um, uh, or we need to get these results out of it, or we need to mitigate that risk. And you need to be able to demonstrate that you have that technical capacity a bit, that you know that why you're putting that control, where you're putting it, and why you're implementing it so that i believe like answers the question a bit on where the, the background should be uh, coming from um and yeah I think from, thank you from my perspective petra and you know just just to add on uh, exactly what lee said um an architect's role really is to uh understand the why but also focus on the blueprint, focus on the standards, focus on the policies, on what needs to be implemented. If the architect knows that bit and they can articulate the whys, I think that sets the ground for what should follow afterwards. And then with, with how uh, at the moment cloud security is so gelled in with application security, infrastructure security, um, and obviously the underlying technology uh, around the supply chain, putting all of that together, it's impossible for one person to know all of these different technologies. So it's a broad understanding of everything else, but a strong understanding of the security side of things, which um, so I couldn't put it better than, you know, all of yourselves, how you put it there. Yeah. Um, I, I'm just going to pitch in on this as well. I like, um, what Francesco said about, um, you know, um, a way to, um, you know, create this role if, you know, you start with an organization that doesn't have the cloud infrastructure still yet so developed. So in a way, you know, the organization grows, um, but also you grow as a cloud architect. Um, so, you know, hopping onto a green field and getting your hands dirty, it's a good way to, you know, put yourself into that role. Um, and going into that now, I want to ask Lee, um, so what do you think is a good background for a cloud security architect and including um, skills? Like, do you think 
uh, a cloud security architect needs to know uh, infrastructure as code, like Terraform, um, some Python skills. Um, yeah, and what, what do you think are some good backgrounds to get into cloud security? You know, I, I spend an inordinate amount of my time trying to hire cloud security architects. So I'll just go through some of the characteristics that I look for when I'm, when I'm looking to hire these folks. I think the first few I'll go through are more personal characteristics rather than technical characteristics. I think as with any architect, empathy is probably the, the key personal characteristic that I'm looking for, because you need to understand what the business wants. You also need to understand the pressures that the development teams are under as well. So that kind of empathy enables you to do the bridge building that you need between the business and the technology. So empathy is, is key. Uh, secondly, pragmatism. Perfect is always going to be the enemy of good. And security isn't a binary question. There's always going to be shades of gray. So is this good enough? And that kind of pragmatism is, again, a key skill of a security architect. Uh, and going back to, I think, to, I think it was what Emmanuel said, things don't always have to be right. They have to be defensible. If you've got a reasonable argument for why you've done what you've done, sometimes that is good enough. But that, in order to be defensible, you have to understand the risks and the threats that you're defending against. So you also need to have that uh, ability to do the threat modeling and the, the risk assessment so you know where you need the controls and which controls are, are good enough. Going on to the technical side of things, it's like with every kind of architect role, really, you need to have a solid basis across lots of different things. So networking, identity, crypto, I think is increasingly important, especially kind of key management, how you do key management on the cloud is always a, a really fun conversation to have with, 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 with teams, but also resilience. Uh, if you're working in financial services these days, there's lots of focus on resilience. How do you do resilience in the cloud? Uh, is multi-cloud actually more resilient or does the complexity make it? less resilient than you, you expect it to be. Uh, but again, that's kind of why you need to have that architect background to be able to, uh, to do it. And also it wouldn't be architecture unless we do start talking about frameworks. So do they have any familiarity with specific frameworks? So uh, the NIST cybersecurity framework, uh, we can always have arguments about TOGAF and how realistic it is, but do they at least understand the language around TOGAF? So can you have that common conversation with people? So if you're doing security architecture, you might be talking with other architects. So you want to know what a, a conceptual architecture is, what a logical architecture is, uh, what a physical architecture is, but probably most importantly, and it's something I always go back to, out of all those levels, it's actually the context. So the stuff at the top that is the most important. Do you understand the business context you're operating in? Do you understand what the business drivers are for what you're doing? And can you then trace those requirements through to what it is you're actually delivering as a security architecture? That was me. I love that. Maybe, well, maybe I want to jump in. And we want to jump in on the on the soft skill that I think we might have missed in the in the very initial thing that is the business understanding and the empathy on understanding that an organization has different speed, different needs, and is something security related is better than perfect security. So two points really really resonated with me in the journey. I think from a technical perspective, I've seen, it, it really depends by the organization you're working in. Uh, so you can work in a large enterprise and you have to deal with a uh, very senior architect and you gather seniority and authority if you speak in specific language or you can boil it down to the technicality. So it's, it's also a role that commands and demands respect because fundamentally you are entrusted with the security of the organization. So if you can't be trusted from a technical perspective and from a business perspective, people don't listen to you. So it's a role that is really critical to, to be respected and to be pragmatic. And sometimes being respected and pragmatic means, I don't know, let's, let's find it out together. And that's to reconnect to that pragmatism, the other thing is particularly critical. And from a technical perspective, I think it goes back to the complexity of the organization. The co more complex organization, uh, you might need a more broader spectrum of things and less code related, even though a flavor of code you might need it in a more startup space where uh, more code is produced and, and disrupted on a daily basis, you might need to be closer to the Terraform cloud form to creating artifacts that can be reused and injected in infrastructure as a code as control because those adapt more. And that goes back to the empathy, but also understanding what kind of organization. If you're working on enterprise and you pivot on a startup, you might die <laughs> the day after because people throw code and destroy code very, very quickly. And I've experienced that because I created one. <laughs> 
<laughs> from enterprise and the things are, are very are very different um but then on the opposite side if you start throwing codes at an enterprise architecture forum they look at you as and and they look at you weird and say what the heck are you going on about we have this compliance framework we have this catalog of control you know what you're talking about in codes so it's it's the empathy on, on understanding where you are what the organization needs. But if we boil it down to one point is understanding where the organization is and inserting the controls that are necessary at that point and then finding the hook point from a business perspective like compliance or requirement that's going to enable you to double down on the why. So to, to add a bit to that, uh, sorry, Peter, please. Go. Uh, sorry, I was just going to that. So thank, thank you, Mariel. I, I was just saying, as a security engineer myself in the field, having sort of run the scan, looking at where potentially vulnerabilities could be, I've actually realized I come at a point where I end up creating a lot of works for the actual person uh, doing the remediation. And I'm not in the good books. And what then happens is that creates some kind of resentment against me for, uh, you know, the analyst or the other team. And so, so, so the way I normally would sort of handle that kind of situation is to, to go in there and let them know that this is not about you or digging into you or looking at your level of work. It's more about just finding out how can we enable security and make it work for the business. But I also work with them by raising things like priorities which bit do we need priority we need to work on a priority basis do it sort of not myself but work with the risk assessment assessment team and then bring that on board and then sort of just very gently work with them and get things sorted out otherwise it's it's a total mess and it just doesn't go anywhere and you're around in circle and just simply arguing how do you go about, you know, sorting this out? And that comes goes back to uh, what Lee was saying is about the empathy side of things and being able to work with people. I think that soft skill is really important when you are in a in a security team as such. And that that was my two cents. I just wanted to add in here. And um, thank, thanks for this. There's there's a question from Iris as well saying how do architects adapt to agile startups and that uh, Fredesco mentioned also. Uh, fr from my understanding, uh, we need to be a bit technical. We don't need to be the, uh, the super gurus on, um, uh, on infrastructure as a code, but we need to have understanding and to be able to read that code and understand what the code is doing. It doesn't matter if you're the person that created the perfect Terraform um, uh, uh, module or uh, whatever you need to create. You just need to be able to sit with the developers or sit with the people and be able to read what they've produced. So you, you then... Again, we're going back to the previous point. You, you could, you can inspire some kind of technical authority and knowledge. And after, after you can, um, you can demonstrate that you understand what they're doing. You can actually consult them on how to adapt that code and then work on that solution. Because I believe essentially, an architect's role is to to help with solution, especially security architect. We sit down and we help them with solutions. What do they need to implement? And how they need to implement them? So provide that guidance, and and then. Uh, like tweak these that code and then make it to make it more secure or make it work with security tools for example you might create uh, in a previous role we uh, we created terraform modules uh, to uh, to do vulnerability scanning and stuff like that or to spin up um, new scanners or to do cer certain uh, certain i don't know jobs like that but yeah hopefully thank that answers to marius thank you so, sorry just to jump in briefly, just to answer Maris's question as well there about how do architects adapt to agile startups. I think one of the things we can do there is look to put the guardrails in place. So if you can do some guardrails centrally, uh, be those in terms of the infrastructure, using things like SCPs and uh, Azure policy, or by putting all of those controls into the, the pipelines, then we can provide a bit of a safe space for the developers to play in. Uh, but there is that is one way of doing it. So you, you give them free reign within a set uh, perimeter. Yeah, and then and then comes back to Kriti's point that we create a lot of noise, and then we need to work on that pain point that we have on how we prioritize, and how we actually um, help teams 
be able to deliver what we're asking, you know, because we're going to come after a vulnerability management scan or after, an, uh, uh, or after a pen test and you're going to, okay, guys, there you are, 20 findings. Go put it into your backlog. Uh, and then you'll have in a small company like mine, we're like 200 people, 170. Uh, and if you're a fairly new company or Greenfield, there's the tendency to focus a lot to features, 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 features. And then maybe they can remediate the high and the mediums because you press a lot and then some of them get left behind. So you have to manage, you manage that prioritization and that delivery aspect of things. And that, that has been one of my, uh, my main challenges, how to prioritize, how to get these involved into sprints, into planning, into, into everything. Yeah, I feel like that's, um, that's a big challenge in security um, generally. Um, I just want to add how I really, really like that you guys mentioned soft skills as well um, as, um, you know, the first point uh, on the skills of the cloud security architect. Um, and I can completely get behind that. Like, I completely agree um, without these soft because soft skills are very difficult to be taught while technical skills someone can learn and you can teach them. Um, so, yeah, uh, continuing on that. Um, we're going to go a little bit more technical, though, and I'm going to uh, ask Manos, um, what do you think, uh, in your opinion, are some good kind of tools for these knights? What swords do they use? Uh, <laughs> like, um, do you prefer uh, AWS or like Azure um, kind of innate native tools, or do you prefer some like other tools to use? Um, or um, at the end of the day, do you think they're irrelevant? So, yeah, go for it. Uh, okay, cool. I like tools. Tools like, you know, when you have a hobby, like the gear is the best thing that you look for. And like, so for us, I believe it's, it's tooling and what we can, how we can make things easier. So um, that, that depends a lot on, um, on the team that you have. Yeah. So you need to come, for example, I work a lot with my infrastructure team that they're going to deploy these tools after, after me consulting them. And they're really proficient, for example, in AWS, um, uh, like native tools. So that works really well for our team and um, it to be honest is is it easy to implement we have to we have to consider a couple of things is it easy to implement um, how much noise they're going to create afterwards false positives um, how easy can we scale them like is that, it's always a scalability uh, thing isn't it and um, do they integrate with any other tooling that we have? For example, uh, we're going to be needing to uh, we're going to be needing to, sh to be shipping logs or stuff like that, maybe to our SOC, maybe to our SIEM, or um, certain aspects like that. So I've worked with people. We've worked really well with AWS tools. It's they're really easy to implement. They're really fast to implement, and they and people that have worked with AWS for a while um, haven't worked a lot with Azure or um, GCP. So I'm going to talk mostly about AWS. Whoever else wants to add some more insight, chip in, please. And, um, and it's been really easy um, for, for these teams to implement this. Uh, but I see from that, from that suite of tooling, they lack some things as well. For example, for me, it lacks a lot of visibility where we're using ECR, for example, to, uh, to patch our uh, containers, but there's no uh, place where I can see what's happening with vulnerabilities of my containers. So uh, maybe at that point, once you implement the tools that you feel comfortable with, so you, you say you have something in place to protect you, maybe on the most, not on the most mature level, but at a good level, and then you can start looking at the next tools for maturity level. For example, um, we use AWS WAF, which is great, uh, but then we use the basic rules and then we have to expand the rules. Maybe should we use with expanded rules by the FI rules from, uh, from AWS store, or do we need to look at another WAF to sit in front of that. And that's a discussion again, that we need to have with our teams um, uh, that are gonna be implementing that to see what, what works best for them as well. Mm -hmm. And um, and yeah, what else? Um, these are the, the main things I would say, um, but there are a lot of tools that are not AWS, um, let's say native, that are really, 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 really good tools, but again, they're going to create a lot of noise and we need to be ready for that noise. So we start with something and then we look to the next maturity level as, because the teams need to grow at the same time to, to manage a more sophisticated tool. So, so yeah, that's my take. It's what, whatever works best um, uh, for, for its company to begin with and for, for the skills that we have. Maybe jump in. 
Sorry. Sorry, go, on, go ahead, Pretty. Yeah. It's, a, it's a topic that you know it's very keen to my heart because I've been fighting <laughs> for it like day in and day out. <laughs> it's the same thing. I'll probably take a, a small step back on this one. And my take is very much into there is always it, knowing which tool to select is always a very big decision because you'd be getting tool X, tool Y, tool X will have a particular functionality, tool Y will have a particular functionality. Both of them probably won't talk to each other and that creates another problem. So if I take a step back and I think from a cloud security architect's perspective, I think if the cloud security architect sort of addresses the um, security policies, the framework, and really understands the business requirements and has set it down into a particular blueprint or reference model that acts like a guidance to which tool you're going for. So for example, if your environment will take on board uh, containers, serverless, and uh, I know you're doing ISC as well at the same time. So you need a small sort of security component into each of these tools. Now, are you going to get a different tool for each of these components? Is that then going to add extra operational overhead for your team? But if for me, that day is very much of one consideration I would take. So I'd probably use that blueprint, which you've got as your environment today to guide you around which tool to go for. And the second thing is also very much to what Emmanuel mentioned is the visibility. Now, visibility is such a big problem at the moment. It's untrue. Um, I've got different, I work with very, very different customers all the time. And some customers have all the development teams spread across everywhere, across the whole world, and using different platforms. You've got a staging environment in AWS. You, you'd then be pushing you know, into production, which could potentially end up being in GCP. Sometimes you don't even know. So the fact that you'd have a tool which would give you complete visibility across wherever your assets are sitting is also another key component, in my opinion. So we say I come from Palo Alto, so I mentioned the Prisma Cloud, but it is something where um, I feel it's your reference model and also what the business is looking for and at the same time reducing your operational overhead, which could be a key guidance in what tools you go for. So that's my take. Frank, back to you. I, 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 like, I like the visibility, you know, that uh, we are all about visibility and, and selecting what's more important. And that reconnects with what Emmanuel was saying that um, regardless of which tool you use, I think what I've seen the best is when the tool is choosing collaborative and the security aren't they work with the team to say, you know, choose whatever tool you want. It's not pushed by security, but it's built in terms of requirement. What we want to achieve with the tool, what we want to achieve with something so everybody can put together their shopping list in terms of requirements of what they want to get out of things. And developer normally want to see less friction, less attrition, while security and cloud security architect want to see visibility and want to see actionability. So it's creating that shopping list and one tool won't fit all, especially in a uh, growing organization with m and &E, where you, you inherit fundamentally a lot of teams that you know want to do their own things and you can't choke them by pushing a tool. And that's probably the, the worst way to actually achieve security because they'll go around you and they'll try to avoid you. So having that kind of, visibility across the boards uh, that enables you to kind of make a decision across cloud security, but also application security. Um, it has proven, has proven very significant. It's very true and critical and, and that visibility is, is absolutely a pain to achieve unless you build something yourself. And then on the other aspect is, as soon as you build a tool, if you haven't chosen a collaborative, then normally, there will be noise and regardless no matter what there will be noise there will be tweaking there will be fixing and if the tool is not chosen collaboratively regardless if it's aws native as you native or so on there won't be buy-in or there will be disappointment or there will be um people will fall off love very quickly so i think if you choose a number of setting or tool or control with the team themselves there will be the whole team battling to actually 
do what's right. Uh, and the friction and attrition will be probably less, or I've seen that less, if everybody was part of the decision of making that, because nobody wants to be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. fundamentally just back on the psychological aspect um so visibility and, and selection of, of what's to fix first and and prioritization i think it's is 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 where we came about and i think it's, it's the most modern problem that we have across the board because the tooling capacity from cloud native or non-cloud native have reached kind of maturity now is, is trying to find among the one million problem which one is the one that's going to hurt you tomorrow <laughs> I think yeah, from, and, sorry, go for it. I think from my perspective, tool selection is incredibly context dependent. Uh, it's going to depend upon what clouds you're using, uh, how many clouds you're using. Uh, I think whether it's Sec DevOps or DevSecOps, it's nearly always ops at the back. And some poor soul somewhere is going to actually have to manage these tools and the output from these tools and do something with them. So we need to have a view as to what outcomes we're trying to obtain by using these tools and use those outcomes to then drive which tools we select but those operational concerns have got to be part of that. So if we are maybe in an old school world that has centralized security operations, you're working across multiple clouds, maybe some kind of third party tooling is useful because you only have the one dashboard or one set of skills to worry about across that cloud landscape. The flip side of that is, well, maybe we, do, we just want to keep as close to the cloud provider as we can do and make use of all the goodness that they provide. And that's kind of why I say it's context dependent. You're going to have different weightings on those decisions depending upon which context you're operating in. Cool. Yeah, thank you. These are some really interesting um, answers. Um, I, I want to agree a lot on how context is important um, and also how context is important in not only which tool to use, but once you have a tool is to filtering out the noise because I found with a lot of tools uh, I had to on the back of those tools go ahead and do some um, you know data analysis with Python or I would have to you know code little scripts to pour all that in a spreadsheet in the end where I can cooperate so um, I would agree with Francesco um, what he said also like there's a shopping list and uh, I guess for every company you need to kind of compile a shopping list. Um, I think it would be interesting, you know, to get ideas from um, people who are in the session as well about like this shopping list, because I would definitely put, um, you know, that there is good visibility, um, like it was mentioned as well um, on, on this. Uh, I want to, um, I would put like that there is more context on the vulnerabilities themselves. Uh, I think Manus, you mentioned ECR, um, because some containers, if they're, um, you know, in an internal system and never exposed, those vulnerabilities are never going to be as high as on some ones that are, um, you know, have exposed endpoints. So um, there's a lot of things that every tool is missing. And I guess we always have to look into this context, compile our shopping list, um, and uh, yeah, then get on the back of um on the back of that, and then Marius mentioned a good point is like, do we just provide guidelines, um, a blueprint, and then you know we let the DevOps team implement the tools that they like? That's also an interesting discussion as well in itself. Um, because you know, it depends who's going to be the end user of those tools. If we as security are going to be the end users, we do want to have influence on the dashboards. But if DevOps are going to be just picking up these things themselves and using the tools themselves, um, a lot of times, then it can be uh, them just giving us um, the tool and we just give them the blueprint. Um, so, Kriti, um, sorry, I, just, I, was, yeah. I was just going to, on, on Mario's, uh, Mario's point, I was, I was going to ask the question back, Uzi, would you, would you have a dev ops team select the security tool? Are I, you, I, I, I do, do. Sorry, to Francesco's yeah. point, we you work with them uh, with the DevOps team to uh, to work uh, to um, to decide on the tool as well. Something, for example, um, I'm um, with my de uh, with my DevOps team. We, they decided on um, on a SAST tool uh, that um, uh, does um, uh, that does uh, bugs um, as well a lot. But that's not such a good SAST tool. 
uh, it doesn't find that many vulnerabilities in the code as opposed to a tool that would have been purely sussed. So, you know, you, you, you get some, something that is a bit, you know, middle way just to, just to get the tool in there, get people, get to use to the tool, understand how it's working and see the value of the tool. And then maybe based on that, you just move to, to a better solution that provides a lot more output and more, because we'll be needing the output to baseline and see what's happening. Um, and Mario, sorry, says, please unmute me again. Mm -hmm. So he can ask uh, the question. Somebody's shaking. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Marius, I'm, I'm muted you again. I, there you go. Defend yourself. <laughs> oh, yeah, I accidentally pressed the wrong button. <laughs> so stay muted. Yeah, so my question is to answer some follow up question to my question. I will allow the DevOps to select a security tooling that they are the consumers of, as long as they have the right output and the right guidelines for them selecting it. If I'm not, as a security, the consumer directly of the output, and I'm relying on them to basically action the output. I'd rather have buying from them selecting the tool with the right guidelines, the right outputs, the right necessary controls that we need, rather than me going out and selecting the tool and never being used. Um, I've been in a lot of scenarios that security always select the tool because we like fancy dashboards and never really gets used or consumed by the DevOps. They never really implement it correctly because they never have buying. So there's always a compromise between the two, right? And I'd rather have a tool in that gets me maximum coverage that I didn't select than a tool in that I selected that sits on the sidelines. Yeah, no, that's a that's a really good point. Um, I agree on that. Um, so Dennis, I see that you raise your hand as well. Um, Okay, uh, and then I have one more last question for Kriti uh, before we run out of time. Shall I just ask the question to Kriti? Because uh, it, it does correlate to tools as well, because it talks about, it's about um, remediation. Well, so, I was gonna just make some comments on the, the thread you guys are doing. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so right, everybody. Um, so the, just a couple of other things. I would actually go even more uh, to not extreme, but I, I would even raise the bar more than Mario's I say, you know, every security tool should be used by non-security teams. In fact, if a security tool is not used by non-security teams, it means you're missing a trick. It means it's only adding value to the security team. It actually means it's not embedded. So I, I, I get it that sometimes the security team has to be the one that finds the budget and drives it and drives the adoption. But even the selection should be something that makes, for the, makes sense for the business. So a, a success story for a security tool or security technology is where it's actually being used by non-security teams, because that's the only way you really scale. When the tools and the techniques and the processes are used by the developers, by the engineers, by the other parts of the business, and the security team is almost the one that provides expert usage or advice or on receiving end on those questions. And, and the other key element here on tools is, is the good old people process technology. Tools are just a part of technology. What I think, what's interesting, Petra, you, you said this and you said, we get the tools and we need to tweak it and they never do what we want and we have to connect. And the same thing that, you know, Kitri said the same thing. I sometimes feel that we, we live in this world where we always hope that you don't need customization. And I, I never start there. I start by the fact, I know that every tool, every process you put in place will need customization. And you need to think about how you're gonna fund it, who, who you're gonna do it, and more importantly, who are the people that you can allocate to make use of that piece of technology. Because Petra, when we worked together, she was on the receiving end of grabbing a great tool that again, adds more overhead to her day job. And that's the problem. We need to think about what are the tiers of resources we can put in place, sometimes managed service, sometimes outsource, et cetera, that can use and operationalize the tools that we put in place, ideally by playbooks. So there you go, that's just my, my comments on that, Petra. I think just, just, just to conclude, and I will still just a second of time, I think um, back on Dini's point, uh, consider a tool as a tool and not a tool to solve all your problem like a magic band. And I have a say, use a tool as a tool, otherwise you become the tool. Yeah, that's very good. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah, Patrick. I think, no worries. I think you um, raised great points because at the end, as I also mentioned, like at the end, it matters who's going to be using it. Like if the DevOps team are 
jumping in the tool, which is a kind of your ideal situation, right? Like the dev team, the DevOps team jumps in into these tools and they just pick these vulnerabilities up and start remediating them. Um, that's great. But if you're the one who keeps having to push them forward, um, you know, and constant like create Jira tickets for them and, you know, just to kind of like, you know, on the receiving end, then, um, then yeah, it, it can be, um, you probably want to kind of have bigger influence where the tools are. Um, so going into the next question. Um, so Chrissy, what do you think? Um, so one thing is, because I'm going to ask you about remediation. One thing is, you know, your opinion on how to actually try to, um, you know, um, implement these remediations and who do you think should be involved in these remediations? Um, does the cloud security architect need to know how to remediate these findings? Um, and what, and another thing is, do you think um, that it should just be, you know, the DevOps team or the, you know, the cloud platform team who's going to be doing this? Um, so yeah, over to you. Thanks, Petra. I think there's different elements to this. So we see we are involved with, at the moment, we're talking about the cloud security architect, dev, sec, ops team. And I think the sec part would definitely be the, the person, the analyst actually doing the remediation. And I do feel from experience and looking at how things are working currently in organizations today, the cloud security architect is separate and the uh, dev sec ops team is separate to that. So cloud security architect is the one who works on the reference models, does the blueprint frameworks, and I very much believe into that, <laughs> very ingrained into that. And then the sec between the DevSecOps would look into the remediation. And you'd also notice that, is it, at least I've, I've seen that happening a few times, is a lot of the times the remediation happens between DevSec, 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 and then it goes to SecOps. So you kind of go back and forth between the dev and the security person. So I would say, I would say from my perspective and how I've seen things working out is cloud security architect slightly different doing their own thing laying down the reference architecture frameworks uh, blueprints uh, and models but it's the analyst who do part of the remediation of the security misconfigurations the uh, the other part is that i there is so many different environments so many different niggly things that it's not possible for one person today to know and remediate every single vulnerability out there. And we don't have to, obviously, depending on the risk appetite of the business. And something Lee mentioned earlier about, and, and uh, Manuel as well, about prioritizing your vulnerabilities. So it's not end of the world if you're not able to remediate every single misconfiguration out there. It's a question of prioritizing how much work you can put into what's essential to the business. Are you doing the viable option of making sure those particular assets are secure, there's no data leaks and so forth. So I would say it, 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 where we are at this stage in terms of your cloud security maturity model, not many businesses are still in between. And that flexibility is important. So most of us who become cloud security architect today have a background of having been either a network security engineer or an application security engineer. And, and because we have that background, we understand and we can remediate. But it's not that we should be remediating. I think there should be another team doing the validation of those remediations of the, the business needs and standards which have been set. And that's the way I see it. I want to jump in there because it's, it's a topic that I think it's really key and critical on, on that because a lot of regulators are jumping on that. Uh, we have the US regulator kind of taking a stand. Uh, the UK regulator, which we're working on, is going to take a stand very soon after. Uh, we have insurance that is taking regulation. I think we should stop talking about vulnerability. Vulnerability is something bad. I think we should start talking about business risk. Because as soon as you start talking about vulnerability, he has an inherent concept of bad. A vulnerability is something that we live by and we've been living with for a long time. It's, it's looking at a business risk and which vulnerability is actually going to 
block us to go to market, to develop something, to be damaged. And in that way, we start talking about fixing problem. We start thinking about what is going to enable the business to thrive and to go forward. And what is the minimal set of things that's going to make us secure tomorrow and build also that kind of idea of a muscle because risk is something that we want, want to be more risky more risk averse is something that shift the posture shift but if we talk about vulnerability it's inherently bad it's inherently the message is fix vulnerability fix it today is critical is really bad and it's uncontextualized well risk must be contextualized to be called risk so stop i, I think we should stop talking about Vulnerability, also because the vulnerability falls into, into a bucket. There are cloud security vulnerability, there are application security vulnerability, and we go back in those silos that we try to smash with DevSecOps. And in a way, we manage to, we're going back to those cycles of, you know, you have ops with their CM and their operation center, we have dev that produce code, and then we have security or cloud security architect or architecture building the design. I think we need to smash against back those walls down. While those walls need to be in there for a specific thing. So an architect has a role of architecture and needs to overlook the different things. But from a fixing vulnerability, fixing problem, needs to be a flat kind of service where we talk only about risk. And then by talking about risk, we can then inject a lot of other variables or a lot of other decision, including the contextualization that is critical uh, into into shifting the landscape and, and in, in bringing also the business into the thing and removing security as an owner of vulnerability or the dev as a, no, a single owner of the vulnerability, but the bringing in the business and the business concept of where are you business in term of risk? Are you risk averse as you risk keen and so on and so forth. I think that goes back to what we said at the start of the session as well about the role of the architect being that bridge between the technology and the business. I think that's a key part of it. When it comes to remediation, I'd see the role of the architect being there to help prioritize the backlog, what gets fixed, what maybe is acceptable. But doing that from the perspective of having that view across the enterprise, because at some point, risk that might be acceptable to an individual project team may not be acceptable to the wider enterprise because it might expose other parts of the enterprise that the individual project team isn't aware of. So that kind of visibility and bridge and risk awareness is probably the key part for the, uh, the architect in that situation. Yeah, um, I think Marius has raised his hand. So uh, go for it, Marius. Yes, hello, can you guys, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to add, because I just wanted to add one point that's what I've been kind of working lately, and I think it all kind of sums everything up. I think the security kind of, and well, in our company, is becoming kind of a, a risk highlight function. So. And what I've been doing in terms of building like DevSecOps is, is teaching developers what is risk. So what is impact and likelihood so they can own their own risks. And the same as what we do in the cloud is we tag in all of the resources, why, whereas department is responsible for that resource. So I can delegate remediation based on the, on the owners so they can own their own risk. And basically security is just advising on prioritization and basically the kind of threat context around vulnerabilities or, or risks. But the idea is that we just going away from owning risk and we are just highlighting risk for business, but the business itself, the, the, the business units owns the risk and they need to be have basically a visibility and insight how they can remedy the risk. Basically, that's, that's what we're working towards. I, I totally agree with that. And, and the approach we've, we followed as well is that in certain cases, you know, based on your risk appetite, you can, um, the risk uh, owners might take a decision to accept that risk or to say, okay, we don't want to fix it. We don't care about it. In, in that case, what we're trying to do is like uh, Mario's, uh, Mario's point that we're trying to assign that risk to a senior manager so they can have the visibility and ultimately they're going to be making that decision that you know something from an engineering perspective we're not going to fix log4j because i don't care it's not interesting for me it's not important at this point so you know if you want to do this we're here to consult and say as security experts we think that this needs to be fixed now if you if you don't want to fix it and remediate it then please review that risk 
so accept that risk because we have a tool where we tra track our risks. And then if things go bad, then we can at least go back and we prove that we do due diligence as security, that we've, we've, we've brought that to your attention. You know, it, it's been a main thing. Please fix it. And then maybe we can try more conversations, even if they, if they don't want to fix it and it's a high risk to just get get more senior stakeholders into it to, to, to change that. If not, there's still, you have that trail as well and you can hold people accountable. So that, that's that's the whole risk um, uh, industry that security is moving to. And it's like, it's really good. Like we've been seeing that for the past years and it really, it really is like a game changer for us, I believe. Yeah. I think it's not manageable for any single architect to know what to prioritize and it's not fair to, to, to leave that responsibility on an architect because you know it, it's, it's a not a human solvable problem. There are so many variables and so many things that need to take be taken into consideration. The day that you have a machine worth of an architect and you pay them a million, <laughs> but I'd rather have you know machine do the machine and architect doing the human work of actually uh, tweaking the risk and making sure that the risk is understood from a business point of view and perspective and risk rather than on selecting what to fix, but helping organization on uh, understanding on how to fix certain things and having machine do the heavy lifting of work. And I might be biased on that subject and topic, but also on the risk, it, it can't be accepted uh, indefinitely. Uh, it needs to be smart, it needs to be measurable, it needs to be time bound. And I think, Accepting the risk needs to be something that is temporary and, and a position that change consistently with the position overall of the organization. And I like what uh, Emmanuel said on, on bringing the position back to the business and the decision back to the business. You want to accept it, accept it. And then having an audit trail in case ops then identify an incident that then needs to go back. And I think with the log4j, we, we saw ops and dev and SEC kind of crossing the boundary because it was, was an omnipresent problem. They need to understand where it is, how bad it is. If it's on machine exposed to the web and back on the contextualization, uh, if it's code, if it's non-code, if it's operation, you know, it wasn't, it was a clear message or a clear kind of alarm bell that, you know, the silo don't exist anymore in incident like that. Yeah. And this is and this is where a good incident plan uh, falls into place that, you know, you have all the teams that are being engaged so you can bro bring in the tech leads or bring in the right stakeholders and have these discussions and you raise the risk and you quantify the risk and you tell them we need to fix this for that reason. And and they have all the conversation, you're all on the same page so they can they can drive remediation afterwards or not. Even though Log4j was handling panic mode. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was handling panic, panic mode, yeah. And then there are people like, yeah, we don't, it was a Friday. You know, it's like, who wants to start patching on a Friday? And we're like, yeah, it's okay. Maybe we can fix it on uh, Monday. can wait for a, week, a weekend. It's not that important. Uh, like, why are you, why are you panicking? Christmas. <laughs> why are you panicking? I'd rather leave it. I'd rather fix it before the weekend rather than leave it for the weekend. You know, we can start working on it or something or else it's going to be crazy. Sorry, Ezra. No worries. Well, thank you, everyone. This was a really great stimulating discussion. Um, I think it cleared a lot of things for everyone who was on the session about this role, because sometimes this role can be muddy, you know, when especially, um, you know, uh, different companies have different views of what this role is and what generally cloud security is. So I think, you know, putting in different points, how, you know, you see it done in practice really, really helps clear some things out. And I hope everyone um, enjoyed the session. Um, I really thank my panelists. These were some really good discussions. Um, and yeah, uh, I guess the next uh, Open Security sum Summit session is about to start. So we can hop on that and uh, cheers. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Thanks a lot, guys. Great Thank conversation. You. Bye. Yes, bye-bye.